Well, good evening. I almost also said good morning. Uh, not used to having uh, evening services here at a church here. But um, if you're watching, listening, if you're here, welcome. Uh, this is our Christmas Eve slash Christmas Day service. Uh, as many of you know, as Isaac mentioned, we're not going to be having a Christmas morning service. We made a decision that uh, we want the families to be staying at home together um, and just celebrate that time, have some family time in the morning. I, I totally, I'm all about families spending time together. My two boys are coming in from California. They should be arriving uh, later on tonight. Uh, I haven't seen them since Thanksgiving, but it just seems like it's been years since I've seen them. I miss them so much. Um, I'm sure my daughter does too, and so does mom. But, uh, but thank you again uh, for watching, for checking us out. There's a reason and purpose why you clicked on this video. Um, and I just want to encourage you to stick around till the end. Stick around till the end because um, there could be a message there right towards the end that the Lord wants you to hear that will minister to your heart. And so, you know, just stick it out. I know you probably have other things that you want to do, but maybe this message here is, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things that you need to hear. As you know, the past several weeks, I've dedicated this pretty much this month to sharing some uh, you know, messages relating to, to Christmas, the birth of our Savior, uh, the importance of it, the meaning of um, the birth of our, uh, of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, and so, uh, basically, all of it um, culminates here tonight on Christmas Eve. And um, the next time I'll be sharing some of these messages will, or similar messages, will be next year. All right. Well, today's message I've titled, That Baby in That Manger. And as I've done, again, past several weeks, I'll be going through a few passages um, and I'll be posting them uh, later on, on the, on the video. But if you have Bibles with you, uh, you can follow along as long as well. So just as we'll be doing in a bit, tonight and tomorrow morning, Christian pastors all across America will be sharing with their churches the story of the birth of Jesus in some fashion or another. Some, like I'll be doing today, will be reading the story directly from one of the gospel books, stories, um, and others will present that same story in different kinds of creative ways. Some will probably have some kind of play or musical or they will have some kind of something, some performance, um, you know, that will, uh, will tell the story of how Jesus was born. And if, you know, you really think about it, some of the really big churches will actually, you know, because it's such a big day, they will dedicate significant portions of their yearly budget to the two days that they know most people will show up to church, Easter and Christmas. That reminds me of a funny story I read. There were four country churches in a small Texas town, the Presbyterian Church, the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, and the Catholic Church. Each church was overrun with pesky squirrels. One day, the Presbyterian church called a meeting to decide what to do about the squirrels. After much prayer and consideration, they determined that the squirrels uh, were predestined to be there, and they shouldn't interfere with God's divine will. In the Methodist church, the squirrels had taken up habitation in the Baptist, Baptist tree, in the Baptist tree bowl. The deacons met and decided to put a cover on the baptistry bowls and drown the squirrels in it. The squirrels escaped somehow, and 
there were twice as many there the next week. The Catholic group got together and decided that they were not in a position to harm any of God's creation. So they humanely trapped the squirrels and set them free a few miles outside of town. Three days later, the squirrels were back. The Baptist church, however, came up with the best and most effective solution. They baptized the squirrels and registered them as members of the church. Now, they only see them on Christmas and Easter. Now, I'm not saying that anyone here are like squirrels, but there are some people, some you know, Christians that just will come on Christmas and Easter, and if that's you, this message is definitely for you. Well, as I mentioned, this evening, not only will I continue with our faith's long-held tradition of sharing the nativity story, but also be sharing just a few other passages that will further elaborate on who that baby was laying in that manger, in that feeding trough over 2,000 years ago. And so my hope is that by the time this message is over, by the time you click out of this message at the end, that by the end of this special service, some of you will have a better understanding who that baby was and why his birth was just so necessary. And so before I start or share a part of that beautiful story, let's pray now. Heavenly Father, we are thankful uh, that you have us all here, Lord. Um, as, as I said, there's a reason and purpose that you brought us here, Lord, and, and I pray that you will make that purpose known. Pray that you will encourage and uplift and uh, those that are here, that you will strengthen those that, are, that just feel weak um, because of just a number of things, that you will strengthen them and, and help them to continue to endure whatever hardships they're going through, Lord. Some are just going through really serious things, Lord, a lot of concerns, a lot of worries, but um, this time right now, Lord, it, it's, we just we leave it all behind. We set it all aside because this is your time. This, we want to hear from you. Or this day, we, we remember. It may not be the official day of, of your son's birth, but we remember the birth of your son, Lord, and, and how glorious and wonderful and amazing that day was. So I pray you will bless, again, everyone here, Lord, that you will keep us safe, that you will bless those watching and listening, Lord, that you will change lives, Store marriages, friendships, relationships, Lord. That more lives will be saved. Use me as your instrumental now, Lord. Pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so our main passage this morning is going to be out of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. I've read that already a few times these past few weeks, but never get tired of reading God's Word. And we're only going to be covering the first seven verses there in chapter 2 of Luke. All right, Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And the Word of God says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered this first registration took place while Quirinius was governing, governing Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, he was, because he was of the house and family line of David, to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth 
and laid them in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. A man named G.B.F. Hollock wrote this beautiful little poem. A bald red head, a puckered face, hands blindly wandering into space, a wee faint smile, a stalwart squall, and yards of clothes to hide it all. Yes, that's a baby. A bunch of sweetness full of bliss, a thing to cry about it and kiss, a blessing sent straight from above, a pound of care, a ton of love. Now that's a baby. I'm sure many of you throughout this month have been have had access to or in passing or somehow some way um, you've seen uh, a nativity set or a nati uh, an image of the nativity and if you don't know what that is again it's it's an image of a manger and there you have uh, statues of or images of of Jesus or Mary and Joseph and Jesus inside of a manger and then you have you might have some animals in the side. Some are really decorated. Some are very simple. Some are, you know, actually are statues. Some are silhouettes. But there are, I even have one at home. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I got that from, that's one of the things I got from my mom before, after she passed away. And so I, I keep that in, in memory of her. But, yeah, you've seen those around. And even the, the image we have, you know, it's something similar, you know. Uh, that's what the nativity uh, represents or looks like, in, in a sense. So, when you look at images like this, or you know, have you ever just stopped? Have you ever just stopped to just think about the depth and significance of who that baby is that's laying in that manger? Not just who he is, but what he will eventually grow up to do for all of humanity, for you and for me. And so I want to start this message with that in mind. Looking at that child and thinking of that child in that manger and asking you all the same question Jesus asked Peter in Luke chapter 9, verse 20. Who do you say that I am? Now, prior to saying this, Jesus had asked all his disciples, who do the crowds say that I am? At the time, rumors about Jesus ranged from the ludicrous uh, John the Baptist to the hopeful Elijah to the improbable. One of the ancient prophets has come back. Now, the answers do indicate something interesting, though. They show that people, there's something special about Jesus. They recognize that in Jesus, a transcendent uh, transcendent presence was on him. There was something special about him again, but they were way off the bullseye. Now, even though many in those crowd were genuinely following him, or some of those in the crowd were genuinely following him, many of those in the crowd had seen the miracles and heard the teachings but they still couldn't grasp the mystery of the kingdom. Nor could they see that the man standing before them was he who holds the keys to that kingdom. Well, now, over 2,000 years later, even though we live in a technological world where we pretty much can get the answers to everything we need in the palm of our hands. 
this generation is still no different, really, than the crowds in Jesus' day. In a poll taken in April 2015, millennials are the only generation among whom fewer than half believe that Jesus is God. That's 48%. About one-third of young adults, 35%, say instead that Jesus was merely a a religious or spiritual leader, while 17% aren't sure what he was. Now, when Jesus said this in, in, in Luke chapter 9, again, he, the first question he asked was to his disciples, uh, who the crowd say that I am. And so here now I want to ask a question. I, if you were to ask all of us, who do the crowds nowadays say that I am, how do you think we would answer I think all of us individually will probably would say different things, maybe a little, maybe different uh, than what how the disciples answered. But I think there'd be a few different answers out there that we would say. But regardless, to this day, almost no one still is is as popular in this country as Jesus. Hardly anyone would dare to say anything negative or anything bad about him. Although some would, I think most people would have uh, a level of respect. But, um, yeah, I don't think many would say anything bad about him. But still, the question remains, how many people actually know the real Jesus? Do you really know Jesus? Do you really know the real Jesus? Well, here are some common perceptions that people may have about who they think Jesus is. Listen carefully and see if maybe one of them, you know, maybe rings a bell for you and you can relate to. There's a Republican Jesus who is against tax increases and activist judges, and for family values, and owning firearms. There's Democrat Jesus, who is against Wall Street and Walmart, and for reducing our carbon footprint and spending other people's money. There's Therapist Jesus, who helps us cope with life's problems, heals our past, tells us how valuable we are, and not to be so hard on ourselves. There's Starbucks Jesus, who drinks fair trade coffee, loves spiritual conversations, drives a hybrid, and goes to film festivals. There's open-minded Jesus, who loves everyone all the time, no matter what, except for the people who are not as open-minded as you. There's Touchdown Jesus who helps athletes run faster and jump higher and uh, higher than non-Christians and determines the outcomes of the Super Bowls. There's a martyr Jesus, a good man who died a cruel death so we can feel sorry for him. There's gentle Jesus, who was meek and mild, with high cheekbones, flowing hair, and walks around barefoot wearing a sash and looks German. There's hippie Jesus who teaches everyone to give peace a chance. Imagine a world without religion and helps us remember that all you need is love. There's yuppie Jesus who encourages us to reach our full potential, reach for the stars and buy a boat. There's spirituality Jesus who hates religion churches, pastors, priests, and doctrine. He wants us to find the God within and listening ambiguously, listening to ambiguously spiritual musicals. There's platitude Jesus, good for Christmas specials, greeting cards, and bad sermons. 
He inspires people to believe in themselves and lifts us up when we can walk on mountains. It lifts us up so we can walk on mountains. There's revolutionary Jesus who teaches us to rebel against the status quo, stick it to the man, and dream up impossible utopian schemes. A few more here. There's Guru Jesus, a wise, inspirational teacher who believes in you and helps you find your center. There's Boyfriend Jesus, who wraps his arms around us as we sing about his intoxicating love in our secret place. There's Good Example Jesus, who shows you how to help people change the planet and become a better you. And then lastly, there's Baby Jesus, who is just this cute, cuddly little baby that, you know, that is, I don't know, I, I can go, you know, explain a little bit more or talk a little bit more about that, but you can just imagine maybe some of the views and thoughts on that baby Jesus. But, but now, really, here lies the real question. Same question Jesus asked Peter there in Luke chapter 9, verse 20. Yeah, they think, again, well, they think all these things about Jesus, and there's all these ideas about who Jesus is. Uh, but as Jesus asked Peter in Luke chapter 9, verse 20, who do you say that I am? Who do you say is that child laying in that manger? Well, we all know at the end of verse 20 there, Peter answered, God's Messiah. And you know what? He was absolutely right. Tightly wrapped, wrapped in a few rags was the second person of the Trinity, God's only begotten Son and the Savior of the world. In Isaiah 9, chapter 6, passage that Isaac read from in our call to worship, the Old Testament prophet wrote about that baby thousands of years before his birth. He says, For unto us, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called, now listen carefully, he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So who was that baby laying in that manger? I honestly, I, I, I can talk about this all the way up until Christmas morning. Um, so I'll briefly try to condense it. Um, I'll try to answer that um, and I'll try to answer that question in the amount of time that we have left together, but C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, writes the following. I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, is Jesus Christ. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That's the one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of, the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up as a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. 
He has not left that option open to us. He, didn't, he did not intend to. So who did Jesus claim to be? Who does the Bible say he is? First, know this. He is God in the flesh. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 30, I and the Father are one. At first glance, this might not seem to be a claim to be God. However, look at the Jews' reaction to that statement. They tried to stone him for blasphemy because you're a, and it says this in John chapter 10, verse 33, um, they tried to stone him for blasphemy because you, a mere man, claimed to be God. The Jews understood Jesus' statement as they claimed to be God. In the following verses, Jesus never corrects the Jews or attempts to clarify his statements. He doesn't say, well, guys, I, I made a mistake. You misinterpreted me. Um, I wasn't saying what you were thinking. Let me, let me retract and, and, and rephrase what I was actually trying to say. No. Again, he stuck with his guns and doubled down. He never says, I did not claim to be God. He, uh, he never says, I did not claim to be God. When Jesus said, I and the Father are one, he truly, genuinely was claiming equality with God. He was claiming to be the same as God the Father. Or, in, yeah, God the Father. In John chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus claims pre-existence, meaning he existed before everybody existed, which is, again, an attribute of God. And he said this, Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. In response to this statement, the Jews again took up stones to stone Jesus. See, in claiming preexistence, Jesus applied a name that was exclusively for God to himself. That name, I am. The Jews rejected Jesus' identity as God's incarnate, as God's incarnate. But they understood exactly, exactly what he was saying. Other biblical clues that Jesus is God in the flesh include John chapter 1, verse 1, which says, the word was God, coupled with John, uh, John chapter 1, verse 14, which says, the word became flesh. Thomas, remember Thomas? Thomas, the disciple, declared, my Lord and my God. And does Jesus correct them? Did he say, Thomas, stop getting it all wrong. Uh, no, don't address me by that. No, he doesn't. He doesn't, he doesn't correct them at all. The Apostle Paul describes Jesus in Titus chapter 2, verse 13, as our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter says the same in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, calling Jesus our God and Savior. Now, with that being said, some of you may be asking, why is the question of Jesus' identity so important? Why does it matter, matter whether Jesus is God? Well, it matters a lot. And let me just share with you a few reasons. As C.S. Lewis pointed out, if Jesus isn't God, then Jesus is the worst of liars and untrustworthy in every way. If Jesus isn't God, then the apostles would likewise have been liars. Jesus had to be God because the Messiah was promised to be the Holy One. 
since no one on earth is righteous before God, God himself had to enter the world as a human being. If Jesus is in God, his death would have been insufficient to pay the penalty of the sins of the world. Only God himself could provide an infinite, eternally valuable sacrifice. God is the only Savior. If Jesus is to be the Savior, then he must be God. It's a logical conclusion. And so thus, all of that, sum it up. It all comes down to this. Jesus, as that child, laying in that manger, he had to be both God and man. As God, Jesus could satisfy God's wrath. As a man, Jesus had the cap capability of relating to us in every sort of way. And he had also the capability of dying. As the God-man, Jesus is the perfect mediator between heaven and earth. And so now that I hope you have a pretty good idea of who that baby was, the next question that we must answer is, for what reason? What was the purpose for him being born? In other words, what was his mission? Well, about 30 years after his birth, we see that there are several instances in Jesus' life where he shows us that he was a man on a mission. He had purpose, which he intentionally fulfilled. Even at a young age, Jesus knew that he must be about his father's business. In the last days of his earthly life, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem where he knew, again friends, where he knew he would be killed. It could be said that the fundamental mission of Christ's time on earth was to fulfill God's plan of saving the lost. Jesus put it this way in Luke 19, verse 10. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. In that passage, Jesus had just been criticized for going to the house of a sinner. Jesus responded by affirming his mission was to save people who needed saving. Their reputation for sinfulness wasn't a reason to avoid them. Rather, it was a reason to seek them out. Many times during Christ's ministry, he sought out to forgive those whom the self-righteous leaders of the day shunned. He sought out and saved the woman at the well and the Samaritans of, uh, at the well and the Samaritans of her town, the sinful woman with the alabaster jar, and even one of his own disciples, Matthew, who had been a tax collector, which is one of the worst people that... Um, one of the worst Jews of that time in those places, in those areas, tax collector. In Matthew chapter 9, once again, Jesus was criticized for eating with tax collectors and sinners. And once again, Jesus res responded by stating his mission. I have not called to save the righteous, but sinners. See, my friends, those watching and listening, Jesus' Jesus's goal was to save. 
That was his goal, was to save. It was a goal, and it was a goal that he reached. It says in John 17, 4, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And he said this, he was speaking to the Father at this time. And again, that's what he said. Let me repeat that. He said this to God, his Father. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. So he did. He completed the work. So, my friends, all through the Gospels, we see Jesus call to repentance and forgive the worst of sinners. We give them all. No one at all. No matter what your condition is, no matter where you're at, for some reason you're watching this in, in prison, in jail, if you're around the world and you know, you're in a crazy situation right now, no one at all is too sinful to come to him. In fact, he goes after those who are lost. As the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin show. And even, my friends, even the story of the prodigal son, Jesus teaches that God will always welcome with open arms those who come to him with a broken and repentant heart. Is that you? Some of you have walked away from Jesus and have decided to, to, to live your life the way you wanted it to live. You want it to be you. And you no longer allow Jesus to, to lead you, to guide you. You put a bowl over that fire, that lamp that burns inside of you. It still burns because you still feel convicted of sin. But you've quieted it. And now you're maybe smoking pot, doing all kinds of other dope, drinking in order to continue to silence that beautiful, gentle voice of the Holy Spirit. Again, it's not too late. It's not too late to come to God, come back to God with a repentant heart, a broken heart, and say, I'm sorry, Lord, for falling away, for failing you. Please forgive me. And you know what? He will. He will forgive you. Some of you need that. Maybe this entire year you have, you've walked away, or maybe it's been several years. But you can come back to him, and he will accept you. And after this message, I will, you know, sharing a prayer with you too do that if that's what you desire and wish. But also, again, I want to speak to those who, are, who have not accepted Jesus, who have never heard the message of, of the gospel. Again, I want to remind you that to this very day, to this very day, Jesus continues to seek and save those who humbly place their faith in him. He will not reject you. No matter how bad you've blown it, no matter how bad you think you've, how uh, far you've gone, he will not reject you. He knows your heart. He can see in your heart. And he knows how you genuinely feel. Some of you have lived way too long and the sin that you're living in now. 
and you're tired and you want to get away from it. And today's the day, Christmas Eve. Tomorrow we celebrate the birth of our Savior. And again, when you, that, that baby that's laying there, wow, just the hope of mankind was there. Your hope. Had it not been for him, him being born and laying there, man, we'd be lost forever. We'd have no hope. Who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say is that baby laying in the manger? Let me tell you again, it's God himself. I know it's hard to, to fathom and to put together, and it's one of those things that um, no matter how many books you read, no matter how many theologians will try to explain it in, in, a, in a very easy or complicated way, it's still going to be too hard for you to for anybody to really put it all together how God could come down and become a little baby but he did and he did that so that we could have that relationship with him my friends Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. That baby is the son of the living God. He's not just another prophet, not just another rabbi, not just another wonder worker. He's not hippie Jesus. He's not Starbucks Jesus. Some of these other things that I read, um, I won't go back to the list again, but he was the only he was the one that so many of those Old Testament prophets had been waiting for. He's the son of David and Abraham's chosen seed, the one to deliver us from captivity, the goal of the Messianic law, the Mosaic law, Yahweh in the flesh, the one to establish God's reign and rule, the one to heal the sick, give sight to the blind, freedom to the prisoners, and proclaim good news to the poor. The Lamb of God come has come, who, had, who came to take away the sins of the world. Jesus came to take away your sins. He did. He is your Savior. He is our Redeemer, and He can be that for you too. Again, on this Christmas Eve, 2022, I want to invite you to come to the cross. If you sincerely believe in your heart, He is Lord. And God raised Him from the dead. And want, and now you have your heart's broken and broken, and, and you're ready to surrender yourself to Him. I want to invite you to the cross where you can lay your sins there and have Him forgive you. Have Him forgive all your sins, past, present, future. And again, I will lead you in a prayer to do that. But first, those of you who have walked away, those of you who have lived a disobedient life this entire year, and you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say that, um, and you're ready to start afresh. There's Jesus waiting for you with arms extended and he will receive you.
So I'm going to lead you in a prayer to, to, to rededicate your life. And, and once I'm done with that, I'm going to lead those who have never accepted Jesus to, to receive him as Lord and Savior. So wherever you're at, I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. If you need to pull over, do so in a safe place where you can pause the video now until, or the, the audio now until you're able to do that. But pray this for those who want to come back. Jesus, I'm sorry for blowing it again. I'm sorry that I lived so long disobedient as a disobedient child, as that prodigal child. I'm not ready. I'm now ready to come back to you. Please forgive me and continue to guide me, to teach me. Lord, I now remove that, that, uh, that bowl that I've placed over the Holy Spirit inside me, Lord, and I pray that that fire will burn brighter and stronger, Lord. You will help me to deal now with the consequences of my sins. But I trust you. I have trusted you in the past, and I know you've been there, and I know you will continue to be there. Thank you for being my Lord and my Savior, Jesus. I accept your forgiveness. Those watching have never, listening, have never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, I want you to pray this with all your heart, with all sincerity. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I admit it. And I sincerely, genuinely ask for you to forgive me. I confess now that you died for my sins and believe with all my heart that you rose from the dead. And now turn from my sins, Lord. I repent of what I've done and confess you, you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. I ask you now to fill me to the brim. Overflow, Lord, overflowing. Fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and teach me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, if you prayed that, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, if you want to hear their story, you want to, you want to know how uh, on this day, Christmas Eve 2022, the Lord uh, saved you. We will be there if you need, have any questions. We can help lead you in your next steps of your Christian walk. Just reach out to us. Um, and we can do that for you, whether it's finding a church or sending you, finding a church in your area or sending you a Bible or, or just need, you just need prayer. I hope that you have a Merry Christmas. We love you and we look forward to, to seeing you again on New Year's Day. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. 
If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.